I remember when I was in my early 20s, I was in the Navy at this time. I was stationed over in southern Spain. And what struck me as really odd when I was comparing Spain at that time, the United States, is although they had super marches, they were very limited in number. And what they did have was an abundance of local, smaller supermarkets that had fresh food, fresh caught seafood, not as many meats as we have here in the States. And you would just go on that day to buy what you needed to eat and everything was fresh. Even the sauces you made were made with real vegetables, etc. And the population of Southern Spain was very skinny, just like the Japanese. But I was recently doing this experiment where I have been trying to eliminate all vegetable oils. And it is amazing once you start going into the supermarket to try to find foods in the center of the supermarket that aren't made with these horrendous oils that we put in our bodies. I mean, I was going down the potato chip aisle and I think out of all of the chips, I found one potato chip and one Mexican tortilla chip that were made with either olive oil or avocado oil, but it explains the issue that we're facing. And I just wanted to ask a philosophical question. So we've had this transformation of food supply into something that you call maximally addictive. What ethical considerations do you think should govern the production of marketing of food? Because to me, I liken it almost a cigarette where when people started to understand the health ramifications about what they were smoking and how addictive it was, we started to do something about it. Do you think we're reaching a point where we almost have to do the same thing when it comes to our food supplies? I don't think we've almost reached that point. This is the biggest killer of Americans. Professor Gerald Mand at Harvard, who designed the food label that's on all food sold in the United States, has calculated that um, obesity and food-caused illnesses kills 678,000 Americans every single year, right? Obesity causes over 200 known diseases and complications from diabetes to heart disease, to dementia, to strokes, to limb amputations. I mean, right down the table. Now you might not think, oh, my uncle Joe died of obesity. You'll think, oh, my uncle Joe died of a heart attack. But if the society was not so obese, he would not have had that heart attack. So I would, the question is not almost, the question is absolutely, well, it depends if we want people to live, have healthy, long lives or not. If we do, then of course, I don't, I wouldn't frame it in terms of it's an ethical obligation on the part of the manufacturer. Food companies want to sell food, right? They'll sell the food that they can sell. It's not the job, it's the job of the society to regulate that food, right? It's the job of the law to regulate that. Of course, we can appeal to these companies to be more ethical, but I mean, good luck with that. How well did that work with the lead industry or the cigarette industry or any industry in the history of capitalism, right? It's just not how it works, right? They will respond to regulation, right? And I've been to lots of places where they made changes and all sorts of things that we can do. And it's really important this because I'm sure we're going to get into the very difficult dilemma I believe people like me are facing now. You've got to weigh two things the 12 risks of these drugs versus the risks of continuing to be obese. And realistically for me, that was the choice, right? I have been obese most of my adult life. I've had periods where I dieted and lost weight and I always regained it. In fact, usually I regain more than I'd lost, right? So realistically for me, those were the two alternatives. That's not true for everyone. Some people, sounds like you're one of them and it's interesting to talk about how. Some people can lose weight just through calorie restriction and exercise and really keep it off. I have someone in my close family like that we all know someone like that. In fact, the evidence shows it's a very small proportion of people. And I, we actually know, I think, why it's so hard to do that. I can explain that as well. If that's, we're faced with that choice, right? Risk of the drugs versus risk of obesity. But it's absolutely crucial that people understand that does not have to be the choice for our children and grandchildren. I went to a country, Japan, where that isn't the choice because they designed their society differently. Their kids don't face a choice between obesity and these drugs because there is almost no childhood obesity in Japan. I've got to tell you, it's a really weird experience going to a Japanese school and walking around and there are no overweight children. I went to a school co called Koenji School, normal lower middle class school in Tokyo, thousand kids. I said, where are your overweight children? To the school's nutritionist. We don't have any, she said. I could see they didn't have any, right? If we make the right social changes, we will not put our kids and our grandchildren in this 
terrible choice between a risky medical condition and risky drugs. But we are where we are. We're in a trap. Let's discuss the nature of the trap door. But we should know that it doesn't have to be that way. And obviously I explain in the book that I went to lots of countries that have made, begun to make the changes or in some cases made them fully that, that could get us out of this trap and out of this choice.